Welcome to Lazy Reviews. Today I'll be talking about the movie Sisu from 2022. Now, this is going to be a critical review, a critique, if you will. This movie has very high ratings. I went into this movie with very high expectations. If nothing else, for the novelty of it being a Finnish Western, I haven't seen any other movies take place during the Lapland War. And I was disappointed because I ended up really not liking the movie at all. Before going further into the review, I will clarify some things that will guide you if you might even find this review at all helpful or if you should just not watch my review of it at all. I can see why it actually is enjoyable and why it may be good. It has a lot of really decent action. It has a lot of really gory action. It has some funny moments. It has some cool moments. It has some very effective scenes. The sound design is quite decent. The cinematography is quite decent. All those areas are quite good. Some of the violence is even quite great. Some of the practical effects, or if they're even practical effects, I don't know if they are practical effects, but the effects are actually good. This movie gets a lot right. Aside from just getting it right, having this setting does make it even more interesting, I would argue. So all that sounds good. And maybe you can enjoy all those things. But the problem is that the movie is too stupid for me. Problematically stupid, even. This movie has the same amount of movie logic, attention to detail, attention to historical accuracy as movies like... I don't even know exactly what movie to compare it to because it has elements of superhero movies. It is more akin to old school action flicks in some of its ideas and in how stupid it is. At least the movies I watch today are often a bit more well-written, have a bit more attention to detail. Of course, there are those that don't, but I think the, the main issues of this movie is that it really doesn't make sense. The more I thought about this movie and the more it progressed, the more problems I found with it. I couldn't feel immersed in the scenes because the geography is all over the place, that nobody acts in a way that would make sense to you. And it's even more problematic when you know the history and when you know details like how weapons work and so on. There are so many reasons why I couldn't like it, but there are as many reasons to as why you may like it. So this whole critique, what I will go into are big issues, petty things, everywhere in between that prevented me from immersing myself in the plot and spoiled my experience with it. It will be spoiler heavy. I will not spoil everything, but there are problems. E even the way the movie ends is problematic in a way. This movie is suspend your disbelief the movie because you really can't think while watching this movie. When I say I know this history, this part of history, prior to watching this movie some years ago, I did a lot of extensive research into it. I should note, I don't speak Finnish. So the research I did was not including Finnish sources, but it was including English and other language sources I could read. So I might be missing some details. And also I'm not a weapons expert. So some of the things I do say you should take it with a grain of salt. I might be too ignorant to be fully correct about these things. So if I am incorrect, please feel free to correct me in the comments or come with a different perspective. What I will be talking about is based on the research I've done and what I perceive as logic pitfalls in the movie. I will also start talking about the historical and technical parts of the movie. If you don't care about historical inaccuracies or a movie not knowing or treating weapons in a more realistic way, you can jump ahead to the second part, which is where I'll go into the more plot-heavy, spoiler-heavy problems of the movie. If you do like this movie, all good on you, I just couldn't. And I hope you at least find my criticism understandable, even if you do not agree that it makes the movie unenjoyable. It's a cool movie. That's a lot of things I do like. About the movie, I just couldn't enjoy the whole experience of it. I think I've come with enough disclaimers so very quickly, what this movie is about is that you follow a Finnish man, a veteran of the Winter War, who is now in the autumn of 44 in northern Lapland when the Lapland War breaks out. This man is a Sisu, meaning that he is too stubborn to die, basically. And in the north, he does come across gold, not just a little bit of gold, a lot of gold. A small unit of SS soldiers discovers that he has gold and they try to steal it from him. And that's basically it. That is the gist of it. It's time to go into the petty territory. So this movie really just doesn't know how weapons work, how armor works, how things like fire works. A pet peeve is that the movie has a hand grenade, a German steel hand grenade. It has a fuse. Sure, it has a fuse in real life, but it has a fuse like a dynamite fuse that has been lit. I don't think that's how they work. It's called a friction fuse, which not being a science person, I'm not entirely sure exactly how it works, but I'm quite sure it's not someone lighting the bottom of the fuse and then it goes up into the grenade. It's a pulling thing and that pull creates a friction. 
So that just became a silly scene because it has a hand grenade that doesn't work like a hand grenade should work. There's a big tank in the movie. I have no idea what the tank is supposed to be because it's a T-55. A T-55 disguised as a German tank, of course that's what the movies do. The Finnish army has a large arsenal of Soviet weapons. Of course they will use what they have. So again, I'm not sure what tank they're supposed to be. If it's supposed to be a Tiger tank, a Panzer IV, whatever. Why didn't they just use a T-34? Finns and the Germans captured a lot of Soviet tanks they used Soviet tanks in their own army, so they could just have used the T-34. It would have been explainable. They didn't have to use a tank that didn't exist in the Second World War. They could have taken one that does exist. It might have made some people confused why they're driving a Soviet tank, but no, it's actually more historically accurate that they would do that. Especially if they're more of a rear unit and more, not one of their main elite forces. They are SS, so they are probably one of the more better equipped units, but... Who knows? The problem with not knowing what tank it is, we are not sure how it should work, what its capabilities are. This tank has a Dushkum, a very effective heavy machine gun. A machine gun that has been used to shoot down planes. This is a very, very, very effective high caliber machine gun with incredible stopping power. In this movie, the guy uses a, what, two, three, four millimeter steel, metal, whatever, iron shield to deflect bullets from it and from rifle bullets. So we should also believe that this can shoot through cars and can shoot through, even if we take it as a MG-34 or 42, we have to believe that it can shoot down planes, but it can't shoot through a millimeter of steel. Again, suspicion of disbelief. If you can enjoy those stupid action movies, doing stupid things, then you will also be able to ignore this. But when you have that scene and another scene, he is using the body of a German soldier to avoid being hit by carrying him on his back. The machine gun is shooting at him repeatedly. These are high caliber cartridges. They could go through him. Moving on to some that's less of a pet peeve. The movie doesn't really understand fire. So this is where we border the superhero territory. The protagonist is basically invincible. In one scene, he lights himself on fire. He's probably burning for 10 seconds at least, being completely soaked in gasoline. It doesn't harm his skin. He suffers no damage from it. It doesn't even burn his hair. Suspension of disbelief, again, if you can really accept movies being really silly and just having these visuals that have make absolutely no sense. Sure, but no, this shouldn't be like that. It, it really shouldn't work like that. It really shouldn't. It's honestly really silly. Cool visual, really silly. That moment is a part of the scene I'll bring up later. One of the more major things that actually also have a lot of impact on the plot is that the movie doesn't really know how patrols work. How Germans drive information, how military units drive information. The Germans have two trucks, one motorcycle and one tank, four vehicles. The way they drive is that the two trucks are driving in front. One is a transportation truck full of soldiers. The other is a truck full of women they have kidnapped. Then the tank and then the motorcycle. There are probably people who will explain this better and maybe I am wrong. But given that the tank is the armored object, the one with the firepower and the one with the defensive capability, having that in front would make more sense. Because if they are indeed afraid of any incoming fire, it might be the kind of rifle fire or whatever that can harm the truck, or even if it is an anti-tank shell or whatever that is threatening the tank, well, they could anyway shoot it later on. They could lie and wait for the tank to get ahead in the column. Normally, in these patrols, you would have the tank in front, or you would maybe have the motorcycle in front. The motorcycle is a scout vehicle. So that is actually what probably should scout ahead and check for any incoming danger. That is how it should work. Or if it, they do have it in behind to save the, the rear of their convoy, it could be used to, to monitor things in the rear and then use that to report any threat behind to the other vehicles. I do know that they don't have radio, but anyway, this is their, this is their role. That is probably how it should be used. Motorcycles should either be in the front or in the back, but either way used in a patrolling manner. And the tank should be having the defensive position in front and then the two trucks in the middle. That's what would make sense. Also, they're driving really close. I don't know how accurate that is. That is probably more accurate. This is getting suspension of disbelief. Sometimes the motorcycle feels like it's 500 meters behind the truck, but then when you see it, it's actually probably right behind the tank that's right behind the truck. So a lot of these things really don't make sense. The geography is all off in this movie. Final thing about historical accuracy and, and technical accuracy, and this is actually the bigger one and the more complex one. It takes place in the Lapland War. This will not be a history lecture. I'll only give the, you the bare minimum of information. It explains that there is a scorch earth tactic being applied to this territory where the Germans escaping the advancing Red Army and Finnish Army, the Soviet and the Finns signed peace 
in the peace deal, the Finns have to expel the Germans from their territory. The Finns and the Germans don't really want to fight. The movie opens up some days into that already happening. This is late September, October, depending on where you are in, in Lapland, all the way into November, December next year. Some of the, There were some that retreated to the very north, near the Norwegian border. Those, those struggles took longer, but mainly it is September and October we are talking about. The burning of Rovaniemi whatever it's called, it takes place in mid-October. So that's the period we're in. We do see the burning. Lapland itself is a very large territory that is north of the polar circle, meaning that it's quite cold. The movie doesn't always treat the cold. But honestly, if you see pictures of the conflict itself, people are not necessarily dressed in winter uniforms, but sometimes people are so underdressed that it does suspend your disbelief. People are sometimes only wearing a t-shirt when, according to contemporary weather statistics, it's around five degrees to some minus degrees during the day. A bit weird that they're just an, uh, so underdressed, but again, suspend your disbelief, a minor plot issue. So the big issue is that, yes, they had the scorched earth practice, they did lay mines, all that they did do. It was a hurdle for Northern Finland, much of it was destroyed. The thing is, Northern Finland was a very sparsely populated territory. And what the movie gets absolutely wrong, again, there might be some exceptions, I just couldn't find these exemptions myself. The Germans and the Finns prior to this war between them breaking out, because this was long in the waking, after the Germans and the Finns realized we will probably fight each other, they started preparing for the German evacuation. In the sense that all people in Lapland were evacuated with the help of both Finns and Germans. They cooperated to evacuate the civilian population. Many of them went to Sweden in refugee camps there. So the problem is then that this movie doesn't recognize that. The movie opens up with a lot of civilians being hanged or having been hanged by the Germans. Given, of course, it might be difficult to evacuate absolutely everyone, but the problem is then that this unit, this German unit, is also seen having captured some five, six Finnish women that they use as, um, I guess you can guess what they use them as. The movie could have explained it away. It could have explained that this German unit, this small company, they call it a company in the movie, but there are way too few men to be a company. It's a platoon. They call it a company. Okay, who cares? But another detail they get wrong. The movie could explain that this company platoon was a rogue unit that had taken these, instead of eva evacuating them, they had captured and hidden these people from the rest of the German units while they were evacuating. There were not small numbers. There were hundreds of thousands of Germans. I'll put up the number here that were evacuated. It was a large army that was evacuated. This small unit, of course, it could have gone rogue, but the movie doesn't even explain that. It could have explained away the biggest plot hole of the movie and the biggest problem of it. Because why is this a problem? Finland has a complicated history, especially in terms of the Second World War. I will not go into the nitty gritty of it. They were essentially allied, reluctantly allied, perhaps, with the Germans during the war in the Soviet Union. You can make the argument that, of course, they were. They had a reason to be. I'm not going to go into that whole debate in this short video. Bottom line is that this Finland has a troubled history here, or at least a history that they might find difficult to come to terms with, or that they might find difficult to present to the rest of the world. It is therefore highly problematic when the movie shows the Finns as being victims of Germany, that the Germans were evil, killing and the big no-knowing women. They did burn the villages, of course, that's true. Finland only being victims to Germans, that the Germans were actually, the Germans did do all these things in the Soviet Union. Not in Finland. The way it's portrayed in this movie is actually essentially serving to arguably whitewash Finnish history. It turns Finland into, into being a victim and not a potential perpetrator, or just for the sake of staying neutral here, not someone who took a more active role and despite the numerous war crimes Germany committed during the war, Finland itself wasn't exactly a victim of it, the way it's portrayed in the movie. Again, aside from the burning of... of of the scorched earth tactic. I think that's important to note because that's something that really rocked me the wrong way. And the movie opens up with this way. That's also some that one of the parts that does did remove my immersion. Like, what is this movie trying to do? This actually feels a bit revisionist in a sense. And that is problematic. Finland is essentially rewriting or reinterpreting its own history in a movie that arguably doesn't know history, doesn't care about history, doesn't care about these details. I am mentioning it because for a lot of people, this is the only thing, especially among a foreign, foreign audience, but I guess also among Finns themselves in some capacity, this is the only media they have ever encountered that covered this topic, and it misrepresents it. It's mis it re misrepresents history, and that is something we, we should talk about. I, I do like you, Finland. I, I do like you. I don't... Please, please don't take... I, I, I'm not here to criticize you. I know you have a troubled history. I'm, I'm here for you. Just when you do revisionist movies... <laughs> that maybe do not try to be revisionist, but 
end up being, so I don't think we should talk about it. My camera stopped recording right here. That's why if the editing looks weird. That's because my camera stopped recording. Finland, I like you. We need to talk about your movies. Especially if they are maybe historically problematic. Does the movie care about history? No. Does it care about details? No. It just tries to be a cool movie. I can accept being a cool movie. What I cannot accept necessarily is being a stupid movie. So let's move into that territory. And now there are a lot of issues with the plot, with the scenes, with the lack of logic, with the loopholes, with the plot holes this movie has. So let's get into it. And it will be spoiler heavy. I will be covering a lot. I am not mentioning them in any sense of rating how problematic I found those scenes. I'm just going up from memory. That I will accommodate what I'm saying with scenes showing it on screen. It has some problems with setup and payoffs. I mentioned before the scene with the fire. The reason why our main protagonist is set on fire is because he decides to mix up on the convoy. They don't have enough vehicles. So some of the troops are simply walking. The convoy is moving at a very slow pace. So that's why this is feasible. He sneaks up on it. Goes to one of the trucks, punctures its fuel tank, gets completely covered in fuel. So the dogs that they have, they have two patrol dogs, or at least one patrol dog, senses that there's some problem here. Then they go to investigate the car, and as they do that, they realize he's there. They send the dog after him, and he then lights himself on fire, smiles at the dog, and then runs into the river or lake. Why is this a problem? Well, I already explained why the fire part is stupid, but there's no payoff on this. Why did he puncture the fuel tank? Is it to make them waste fuel and run out of fuel so they can no longer use the car. If that is the case, then that's not what happens. This car is seen driving up to the very end of the movie. They don't take fuel from any other vehicle. This vehicle is still left driving. So if his whole purpose of him setting himself on fire, putting himself in harm's way, was to not even disrupt this car, not even proper sabotage it. Why did he do it? That's a problem set of a payoff that you don't... In the beginning you think, okay, maybe there is some logic reason to it. Maybe he's just slowly taking out the vehicles so they're easier to pick off when they're only walking. If that's his intention, the movie doesn't tell you that. So that's the first problem. And a big plot hole, actually, when you think about it. The more you think about it, the more risks were involved in this. We are seeing him running into the water to hide. And yes, he does come up for air every now and then. Again, it's October. It's probably really, really, really cold down there. Probably lethal. But again, if, if he's a superhuman, we can kind of suspend up disbelief. He can also hold his air for many minutes. And the Germans, thinking he's dead, go down after him one by one to find the gold. I don't understand. One thing is, okay, sending your dead men down into a really cold river. Already really, really dangerous. Having them drop to the bottom and then try and find gold. I don't know if, if Finnish rivers are somehow magical. They are dark. You're not really able to see anything down there. How are they supposed to find this gold by jumping down? Of course they're desperate, they want the gold, so that they try and do it and risk their own man is understandable from the movie's logical point of view. But it's just absurd when you think about it. And also they keep going down one after one trying to kill him. They're seen wearing having grenades. I am not entirely sure about this. I was thinking, couldn't they throw a grenade in there? I mean, maybe they, it wouldn't even kill him, but it would be better than just trying to jump in and I don't know what what wrestling him on the water. What are they even trying to do in this scene? This is where I also wouldn't mind being corrected. If you can use grenades, if you can throw a steel hand grenade in water, and if it can still blow up in water, or if it would somehow interrupt the fuse, or even if it does blow up, how big the explosion would be underwater, if the shrapnel would be a problem at all, if it would maybe destroy the bags of gold. I don't know. It's not a big issue, but this whole scene just comes off. This is also the last scene where we see the guard dogs, from what I remember. I don't know why they're just taking out the movie, but they are. They're no longer in the movie after this. Another plot hole is that they actually do catch him at some point, and they then hang him. But they apparently don't know how to hang people because he survives the hanging. Not only does he survive the hanging, he hangs there for quite a while. I don't know why the Germans couldn't tie the noose, probably. Unless they really wanted it to be a very, very slow hanging, but they're standing there seemingly waiting for him to die. So they, think he, he, they probably think he's dead when they leave. The reason why he's not completely hanged is that, and that's actually a cool visual, he does have an open wound on his back and he places that wound, he, he raises himself and places it on a spike in, in this sign he's hung on. So he's not lowered too much, meaning he's not choked out, but he only does this after the Germans already left. Or after they already butchered the hanging, basically. There could be more explanations to this. This is just something I found really odd. And here is actually another problem with the historical accuracy here. Something I really don't understand. They are hanging him in the sign to a petrol station. Now, what does World War II, late World War II, hanging at a petrol station remind you of? It should remind you of the hanging of the Mussolini couple. After they were killed, they were hung on display at a gas station. 
It's not the same gas station as in this movie, but couldn't they have chosen something else? The symbolic value, that means that he's Mussolini. Right? That, that's what it means. For us, the symbolic value of this scene is that he's Mussolini. Again, this movie doesn't know its own history. They could have done something else. Why did they make this decision? It's really odd. Why, why do you kill him the same way as Mussolini was put on display? He's the baddie. Is this the baddie? Is our main protagonist the baddie? He's killing Nazis. He's probably not the baddie. But what the fuck is this movie trying to tell us? And talking about suspension of disbelief, there are other elements I should bring up here. It's one of those movies where people don't shoot when they should shoot and people can't hit when they should hit. There are so many scenes in this movie where the Germans could easily ha have killed our protagonist, but they don't. It is kind of used in a funny way at the end of the movie, but it's only funny if you accept how stupid it is. So he's standing, beating up a guy, unarmed, aside from a pickaxe. A pickaxe is actually his main tool in the movie. Again, a cool idea, but also a bit silly. The motorcycle drives up. It has an MT40, uh, MT34 attached to it with a gunner. Instead of simply shooting him, he slowly points his pickaxe at them and they abandon the vehicle and their weapons and run away. Do I have to explain why this is silly? I mean, of course, it's kind of cool that he has intimidated them so much. He is this war hero that they are all talking about. All the Finns know him. He's kind of, he's not immortal, but he refuses to die. Even then, they have a clear shot of blowing him to pieces. We have seen him, he has multiple scars. We know he's not actually invulnerable to bullets. If this was the only scene where they didn't shoot when they should have shot, it wouldn't have been a problem, but there's so many scenes where it happens. So there's one scene where the tank, it's a, towards the end, where one of the cars, one of the trucks, the women are broken out and are all given weapons and are now shooting the Germans and have, been, have captured a truck. As I said, the trucks are in front of the tank. Right in front of it, the tank should see what's happening. Instead of deciding to shoot or ram the truck, I don't know if there are more bullets. There probably are more bullets, but I don't know if there are. Or, or shells. Instead of trying to destroy this truck with the women in it, hostile women, it drives away. It just drives away. It avoids them. You actually see it pointing at the truck. At least the the officer's coppola, the, the, the vision slot of, of the tank you're seeing from the tank's point of view, is pointing at the car. Why didn't you just destroy the car? The truck, I mean. Can somebody tell me what the fuck is going on? Nothing. It's all good, sir. Another really stupid thing. This movie has so many issues of people not seeing things they should have seen. Again, as I mentioned, we have one truck, then maybe five meters, another truck, then five meters, the tank, and five meters, the motorcycle. In one scene, right before they're given these weapons, another plot issue that is less of a plot issue is that these women are very capable with weapons. Had they ever shot before? Probably not, but I know it's a minor issue. And this truck with the women in, it has, it's a covered truck, so you can't see what's going on inside of it. It has three soldiers attached to it, or maybe it's only two, and then one driver. And the men inside, they hear things going on outside, and they're slowly being dragged out and killed by the main protagonist using his pickaxe. Is that a cool idea? Kinda? How does it work? Where is he standing? How does he kill them? It's a bit silly, but it's not the worst. One of those things where you can suspend your disbelief if it was not for the tank behind it. How do they not see it in the tank? How do they not see that five meters in front of them, the men are getting slowly killed by a man sitting or leaning on the side of the truck with a pickaxe? How are they not seeing this? It's right in front of them. And then the people who do see something don't react to it. So as I said, the motorcycle is behind them. They keep driving over the dirt Germans that are thrown out of the truck. Instead of reacting to it, they say, hey, is that, uh, is that this guy? Is that that guy? The, the, a guy who, who definitely shouldn't be dead. Instead of reacting to it, they just ignore it. If someone had actually died, they should drive up to the tank, up to the other men, reporting that they just saw the dead comrades. This movie doesn't, they don't do that. They ignore their dead friends. They don't report it to anyone. What the f*** is happening in this movie? The women in the one truck kill the men in the other truck. So at one point we have the tank that drive ahead, drives ahead of the truck with the women, and then we have the motorcycle. Then we actually cut from that, so we no longer see that in the movie. At one point, after our protagonist assaults the tank with his pickaxe, another really stupid scene, the motorcycle catches up to him. And that's why they abandon the motorcycle, as I said. Maybe one or two minutes later, the women walk up with the weapons. This is a place where we've always seen there are only very, very few roads. People are following the same roads. How does this... Where, where did this truck stop? And then they would walk on. And where did the motorcycle driver... So they have been here, the motorcycle driver has been here, they have stopped the truck and walked, and then the motorcycle driver just ran through them without seeing them? When the two men on the motorcycle ran away, did the women kill them? We don't have gunshots. 
but they would have run right into them. The, the, the geography, this movie is really poorly, it really makes no sense. It's all over the place. There's no logic in this movie. I haven't even gotten into the scene where he climbs a plane with a pickaxe, where he survives a, a plane crash into, maybe it's a swamp. Everything else is destroyed, but he survives it without a scratch and walks out of a bog or a swamp. I'm, there's so many things in this. This movie has so many problems. I'll not get into all of them. Another minor pet peeve. He at one point walks to Helsinki. We've seen Helsinki burning. At least we see smoke coming from buildings as if they are burning. Helsinki was bombed in February. This movie takes place in October or November. Why is Helsinki still burning? Small pet peeve. Uh, just a small plot issue. There are many other issues I could mention. The very last thing I want to mention and a problem I think perfectly encapsulates the issues of the movie comes right at the ending of it. The tank arrives a plane that's waiting for them. We have been told earlier that this plane will be waiting for them, very briefly in a conversation. This plane is Soviet and the pilot is Soviet. Apparently, at some point, the plan to take the gold, the officer explained that if they are actually evacuated, they will be executed for war crimes. So they might as well use the gold to start a new life. It's their only way out. And this plane is their way out. They are supposedly wanting to get away with this gold with this Soviet officer. There are many issues with this. First of all, when did they make this deal with the Soviet pilot? They only found their gold on their way when they met the man. Presumably in the beginning of the movie, they were on their way to be evacuated along the rest of the German units. Or they already planned to fly away with this man. But if they did so, why would he help them? Why would he be a traitor to his own country to help someone that didn't offer anything in return? It's more credible they planned this after finding the gold, then they had someone who could help them escape. But if that's the case, how did they make this deal. Even if the tank has a shortwave radio or some other means to contact a Soviet pilot, how could they do that through a secure channel that doesn't isn't hurt by any other German unit, that isn't interfered by any other Soviet unit? How could they possibly have had this conversation where they arrange a time and a place to meet? Also where they apparently convinced the Soviet pilot. How did they, hold, how did they even meet the Soviet pilot? How did they possibly set up this deal? And if they made the deal before the gold, what was in it for the Soviet pilot? And also how did they set up this plan? How the hell did they contact a Soviet pilot? That alone is problematic. How did they get into contact with the Soviet pilot in the first place? Why did he agree? How was no other Soviet pilot or no other Soviet unit informed of this? How would the Soviets not really have reacted to one of the planes going rogue? How could all this be arranged? It would have made so much more sense if they arranged this with a Finnish man, but it's a Soviet plane. So why would the Finnish man have a Soviet plane? I also think it's he has a Russian name in the movie. I'm not entirely sure about that, but it's quite clearly supposed to be a Soviet plane and a Soviet man. And even after they got the hand of the gold, there's a big, another big plot issue. When they get the hand of the gold, and probably when they would have made the deal, there are between 20 and 30 Germans. Even being generous and saying some of them had been killed off, there would have been maybe 15 Germans left. Why is this a problem? Because when they arrive at the final destination, the pilot nods to the officer and the officer then kills the only other German soldier left alive. Meaning that it seems to have been a part of the deal that there were only two of them supposed to getting money and all the other Germans would have been killed off. But without the interference of protagonist, there would have been 15, 20, maybe 40 people supposedly splitting the money at the end of it. Would the pilot have agreed to this? Would they have tried to kill all of them? What is the plot here? What is the plan here? And not even just the splitting issue and this survival issue and, and this whole how did they get into contact and how did they agree to this issue. Where are they going to go? They can't go to the Soviet Union. The pilot will probably be killed as a traitor and the men will be sent to a prison camp. Sweden will probably not allow them to land there. If they land there, they will probably also take a prisoner or maybe even shut down. Norway is occupied by Germany. How can Germany let a Soviet plane land somewhere? Where are they going? They have limited fuel. What is the whole plan here? It's honestly baffling stupid. This whole ending encapsulates all the flaws of this movie. How poorly written it is, how full of plot hole it is, it makes absolutely no sense, yet it has some good scenes. That's why I'm saying that the only way to really enjoy this movie is being too stupid to realize how bad it is, or enjoying the action, the music, the effects so much that you can completely suspend your disbelief. And I think it's perfectly valid to do that. I couldn't do that. If you enjoyed this movie, regardless of all the flaws of it, all the power to you. I'm not trying to take that away from you. I hope I just presented a strong case for why I think it is perfectly valid to criticize this movie. For the reasons I picked to criticize it for. I still, as I, in the beginning, I praised it for a lot of things. Just, I said that those things were not good enough for me to like it because of all the issues. I hope you found this review useful if you stayed all the way through it. This movie has had such a good reception that the only reason why I made this video was because I think the more critical 
voices were maybe needed. I don't have a problem with this movie really receiving all this attention. I think the other reason why I made it was for the reason I made it. Essentially, kind of being revisionist, kind of being whitewashing its own history. I found that to be problematic and that was actually the tipping point. I was really not sure I wanted to make this video. I don't like spreading all this negativity. The more I thought about it, the more I felt like this should be something that, that should be mentioned. So that's why I decided to make this video. I could have gone into way more detail. Anyway, thank you for watching. Have a nice day. Bye.